Our next guest is a cognitive scientist who specializes in researching how students learn and is a professor at the Berkeley College of Music. Please welcome Pooja Agarwal to the South by Southwest studio. I always feel like there should be applause right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, will you please briefly explain the science of how we learn? The science of how we learn. We have an innate ability to learn. And because we are all learners, we all have this feeling about how learning works. I think that's pretty straightforward. What's so neat about the science of learning is that we can conduct experiments on the tiniest scale of how people learn words or sentences. But then we can expand that to the science of learning in classrooms, in schools, in workplaces, throughout our career as lifelong learners. And so being able to use rigorous experiments to determine causation, for example, how we can figure out what helps a learner better. Is it to reread their notes? Is it to take notes? Is it to teach it as well? And so those types of experiments in the scientific literature help build this foundation for our understanding of learning that gets a little bit beyond our intuition of learning. That just makes it so much more exciting for me. I mean, we all learn differently, so is there thematic ways of learning that are, are able to cover most people? In the science of learning, what's so much fun is that we can develop the patterns of learning across lots of people. So just like you said, we do learn differently, but we also kind of learn the same, and that's what the science of learning shows. So even though we do have kind of individual approaches, so for example, you mentioned that I teach at the Berklee College of Music. Some of my students study their guitar in one way, and some of my students practice in a different way. But if we look at patterns about how musicians learn their instruments, there are commonalities that we can build on that apply to all of us, which makes it so exciting. Well, for one thing specifically um, that I'd like to ask you about is retrieval pr practice. Yes. Um, tell me about that. <laughs> retrieval practice is this simple research-based idea of retrieving of pulling information out of your head. So one example I like, I have a question. Do you remember what you had for breakfast yesterday? Yesterday, yes. It was um, a bar that I ate on the way <laughs> running to the studio for practice. Did you have any coffee? I had coffee. Well, I mean, that's routine. So. Okay, yes. yeah, yep. yes. So that, that effort to think back, your eyes kind of wandered, right? You're mentally traveling, that's retrieval. That's going to get something and retrieving it and bringing it back. So with retrieval practice, we know that it's one of the most effective ways to help students remember what they're learning and to help them over the long run. It's pretty intuitive. When you practice what you know, you get better at it. You practice uh, a sport, you practice your instrument, you get better. What's sometimes missing is that in the classroom, we need students to practice their knowledge as well. And so retrieval practice is anything like writing down two things they learned in school today, writing down their thoughts on taking a key concept but applying it in their own lives. That's all retrieval practice. Okay, so our brains are this cloud storage of, of everything that we've seen and learned. Yeah. Is there a special way to retrieve that, I mean, is it just practice? Like how, how, do, how do I go in and get those memories that I can't remember? <laughs> it takes practice, right? Okay. <laughs> um, another example is learning people's names. That is so hard for everyone. Yes. And learning people's names, sometimes when we meet someone for the first time, if I meet someone named Jeff, then I just might in my head say, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Oh, nice to meet you, Jeff. Jeff, right? You're rehearsing it. But in order to bring that memory out, we need to retrieve it mm -hmm. and we need feedback. Another component is that forgetting is a part of learning. So the more we're able to talk about forgetting mm -hmm. and retrieving, and remembering and getting feedback, then it feels less uncomfortable. It'll feel more comfortable to mentally travel and to do that retrieval. So there aren't really secrets per se. <laughs> there isn't one best way because it's so flexible. So I, um, with listening to podcasts, people like talking about the podcast they just listened to. Yes. That's retrieval. That's okay. exactly it. That's retrieval practice. Talking about what we know, practicing it, thinking back to our favorite vacation, that's all retrieval practice. So when I get in the car with my kid and she's had a full day of school, yeah. 
asking, okay, what did you learn today? Mm -hmm. That's a practice in retrieval. Yes, I would add on to that. Yeah. That's the foundation of retrieval. One way to give her a little spark and to help her memory is to ask her instead of what did you learn in school today? I, maybe she says nothing. <laughs> okay, you, you've met her, <laughs> she's 12, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> is to switch it a little bit to say, what did you learn in school yesterday? Oh. Okay. So there's that added challenge, and it makes our eyes light up, right? Even for kids, it's that, oh, what did I learn mm -hmm. yesterday? And reliving that experience is a great way to use that time on the drive home. Okay, so I imagine that um, this is gonna help with testing. What kind of recommendations do you have for being able to retrieve under that pressure? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Studying for tests. Um, one of the things to help relieve that pressure is to try to retrieve early on. Now we all cram. I crammed before my exams. So it can be a little hard for a student to get into that routine, for a kid and for their parent. But to try to retrieve maybe every day or even in the morning at the breakfast table and in the evening at the dinner table leading up to that exam. Because what happens sometimes is as students start studying more and more furiously before a test, it develops this illusion, this feeling of confidence. Oh, I know this. I got this test because they've been going through this easy studying. But with a slight challenge of retrieval, it's kind of a check on yourself. Oh, I, I don't know that. I do need to study that more. And so trying to do that more often and a little bit further in advance can make a big difference. See, I tried to do this uh, when I was studying, I believe it was the state capitals, and I recorded <laughs> myself saying them on a tape, and then I had just heard of osmosis, so I played it while I was sleeping. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. Not in case, really, no. In case you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so explain interleaving to me and how that approach boosts results. Ah, interleaving. So actually, with the state capitals is a perfect example. Interleaving is just mixing up information that's related, but to help you kind of remember the middle. So sometimes what people might do, maybe you try to study the capitals in alphabetical order. My guess is that you remember the first capital starting with an A and the last capital close to the Z, <laughs> <laughs> but the capitals in the middle are harder. Uh, another example, my colleagues have done research on the US presidents. And when we ask college students to just write down all of the, the US presidents they can think of, we remember the first few, George Washington and so on, and we remember the most recent, but the ones in the middle, we just don't have. And so with interleaving, instead of going through in order of things, is to start in the middle, to mix it up. My music students start in the middle of their songs. With math, instead of just going in blocks from addition problems to subtraction problems, students can plug and chug. They're like, okay, these 10 are addition, <laughs> let me switch gears, these 10 are subtraction. Interleaving is taking those related concepts and mixing them together. So now a student has to read the problem, like a word problem, and think, oh, is that addition or do I need to subtract? So interleaving helps with that discrimination as well. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, you've studied feedback. What's the best type of feedback and what is the least useful? <laughs> the best type of feedback is elaborative feedback, which is intuitive. The more explanation we can give people to help improve their learning, the better. Now in a classroom setting, Feedback can take a while. Yeah. <laughs> so we do know from research that any feedback is better than none, but we also know that retrieval practice is effective with or without feedback. So elaborative feedback, one of the best ways, not necessarily a bad way to give feedback, but even just a correct, incorrect, or a short answer for feedback works really well. Okay, well now that we know that cramming is not the best way, <laughs> um, can you tell me what is the best space for learning? Like what's the best way? In terms of the environment of what's around you? Yes. Okay, so one big myth is okay. that students, one myth is students like to listen to music while studying. I heard that since I was a kid, that if you play classical music in the background, it'll help your brain. No. Busted. <laughs> busted. What? Myth busted. Yeah, so there's research demonstrating that when students listen to music while studying, it decreases, for example, their reading comprehension. So in this one study, college students read uh, SAT passages, and then they took a reading comprehension test. 
and they listened to music they liked that they chose, like Katy Perry. Mm -hmm. They listened to music they didn't like, like thrash metal. They listened to music without <coughs> lyrics, and they listened to nothing. It was just quiet. Yeah. And students, after reading these passages, their test scores were the best, about 65%, on the reading comprehension test when it was quiet. My daughter's not going to like to hear this. <laughs> it was about 30% <laughs> when people were listening to music, whether it was music they liked or didn't like. 30% is huge. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, well, what are some of the popular teaching techniques that make you cringe because they are just the antithesis um, to your, your scientific yeah. ideals? Oh, one of the biggest ones is learning styles. Explain. Learning styles, if you've heard the phrase visual learners, auditory yes. learners, kinesthetic learners, that's a myth. Again. Again. Busted. Yes. Okay. That's not a thing, okay, because I, I feel like when kids hear, okay, I, I learn in this way, mm -hmm. then they focus on that particular style because they're like, oh, well, I'm a visual learner, so I'm only right. going to do it this way. Right. On the contrary, what we know from research is that people learn best when they're challenged in lots of different ways. So at the Berklee College of Music, a student can't learn guitar by just watching a professor visually. Right. Or by just listening to the guitar. That makes sense. They have to touch the guitar and play it and listen and watch. So even though there are individual differences and preferences, on a larger level when it comes to studying and teaching, it's most effective to challenge students in a variety of ways rather than I'm going to teach two visual learners or teach two auditory learners. We need to teach in a variety of ways to boost student learning. Okay. I mean, that's probably more useful when you have a whole bunch of different kinds of little kids to <laughs> exactly. speak to. Now, this is just personally for me. Um, you're a proponent of lifetime learning. Yeah. What advice do you have for somebody like me who may have been out of school for a while? <laughs> how, how do I... I, I want to know how this retrieval learning, how can I apply it to myself? Oh, so lifelong learning. I'm a big fan of learning Spanish. I'm always trying to improve my Spanish. And I recently took accordion lessons. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. I'm fascinated by the accordion. So as a lifelong learner, I know that my Spanish comes and goes when I get to use it when I travel. If I don't use it, if I don't practice my Spanish, it goes away right out of my head. Yes. Accordion, I didn't even really practice, honestly. I love it, but I would just practice like an hour before my lesson. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of people do that. A lot of kids growing up, I played mm -hmm. violin and I just kind of crammed right beforehand. So even as lifelong learners, we need to practice and we need to space it out over time. I took high school Spanish, but I didn't start traveling until about 15 years later. That's a big gap. But if we can keep refreshing our knowledge as lifelong learners, that's going to help us retain what we need to know. So those apps that make you take just a couple words every day, is that something oh, that would... Oh, myth bust. Again? <laughs> really? Yes. So brain training does not necessarily improve our attention spans <laughs> or our memory ability. Lots of research has shown that what brain training games do mm -hmm. They get you better at the game. Yes. It creates this illusion of confidence. Oh, I'm smarter. I'm getting good at this. I thought I was. So we feel like <laughs> our attention's improving, our memory's improving. It's not. What happens instead is if you do a lot of Sudoku or crossword puzzles, mm -hmm. you get really good at Sudoku and crossword puzzles. Your brain learns the pathways and the tricks, but yes. not necessarily the information. Exactly. It doesn't transfer. <sighs> so it's not as though you're going to do brain games and then be better at multitasking. Humans multi-fail. We cannot get better at that. And the brain games are not going to help with that either. Sleep yes. and exercise yes. and social interaction are what improve our brains the best. I like all of those things. Like, that I can implement. <laughs> yes, and okay. it's free. <laughs> I mean, since I have you. <laughs> okay, I heard this myth because now we're on this, um, that if you are somebody who plays a musical instrument, mm -hmm. that somehow the functionality of that makes you better at math. Is that true? I just feel like mm. you've broken every dream so far that oh. I've had. <laughs> of um, <laughs> shortcuts, so yeah. tell me. Oh, not a shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can be really great at math with practice. Of course, there's a lot of math involved in music and practicing an instrument, so it's one way to get really good at math. 
But other ways to get really good at math are a lot of life examples. Of course, a lot of practice in schools. We all memorized our multiplication tables. It's not as though, I mean, music has a lot of special qualities but so do a lot of other activities. A parallel is that when um, musicians are having their brain scan in fMRI machines, mm -hmm. their brains are completely active. You and I sitting here, our brains are also completely active. With music, it interacts the brain in different ways than if we're watching Netflix or if we're talking to a friend, but both are beneficial in the same way. They're using our brain the whole time. You can get better at math with music, but you can get better at math with apps, with practice at home, with doing some basic arithmetic as well. Just take some practice. So get better at math, you get better at math. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I mean, uh, what recommendations do you have for say teachers, parents, all educators who have students who have fallen drastically behind because of the pandemic? Oh, um, I have taught online on Zoom for a year and a half, and some of my students are feeling that struggle. A lot of my students are feeling that struggle. I feel that this is a critical time point to be talking about learning, how it works, and especially how we forget. I worry that we beat ourselves up so much when we forget, but forgetting is a good thing. That's what causes the struggle to think about your breakfast from yesterday. I like that. And so with even during the pandemic, we have forgotten a lot, but that's okay. And I think giving ourselves that permission to be gentle, that's how learning works, we actually will experience something we call savings. As we learn more, it's gonna come back quicker and quicker. Kind of like if I go travel, I use my Spanish, it comes back more right, quickly. Right, right. Wow, so your advice is basically be kind to yourself, yeah. get the sleep, get the exercise, <laughs> find joy. Making yourself a happier, more whole person yes. is what's gonna help you. Yes, and retrieve what you know. Oh, okay, <laughs> so all the crossword puzzles, all the Sudoku. <laughs> I feel like everything I've learned has been busted now, yes. so I'm gonna have to do a complete reset, but luckily, having a daughter who's uh, currently in school, I'm going to apply everything from your book. Fantastic. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. So what else, what is, what do you think is the most important thing I can do as a parent? Oh, as a parent, I would say it's hard to pick the most important. Well, yeah, because like the, teachers, <laughs> the teachers have all day at school. Right. They have all day and, and I, I can't help that. But what I can help is when she comes home from school and I want to help her. I want her to be able to retrieve. I want her to be able to, you know, hold on to that knowledge so that she doesn't yeah. forget her French someday, <laughs> you know? I, I, I'm, I've yeah. invested a lot in her learning. So, of course. I mean, what advice do you give parents to help out in these processes? Are there exercises? What can mm -hmm. I do? One thing I've noticed is that as parents, we try to help students once they've finished their homework. We might yes. look through it, see how they did. Mm -hmm. Try to flip it. So instead, ask your kid, what do they know? What's their homework about? What are two things they remember from their chemistry class Ooh. before they get to their homework? It's kind of like a warm up that gets yeah. the juices flowing, and that's retrieval. Different from kind of maybe they have their textbook open, they're filling out a worksheet, that's studying, that's getting information into their heads but it's not pulling it out. So they're just checking boxes, they're not absorbing yes. necessarily. They're not absorbing and they're not practicing their knowledge. So if a child practices their knowledge with their parent before homework, they're gonna succeed at that homework so much more than if they're slogging through it and yeah. then they experience the like, yeah, here's my homework, please check it. Okay, I feel like ugh, you have made me a better person. <laughs> a better parent, and everybody watching is probably a better education uh, administrator now. So thank you so much. I am so excited about your book, and I hope everybody reads it. Go ahead and plug it. Thank you so much. Uh, it's called Powerful Teaching, and I am just so excited. The subtitle is Unleash the Science of Learning, and that's what I am so passionate about. Unleash the science of learning. <laughs> I love it. All right, Pooja, thanks for joining us today in the South by Southwest studio. Thank you so much. We'll be back here at 1.30 talking with live, the former U.S., of course he's live, I read that wrong, the U.S. Secretary of Education, John King, who is running for the governorship of Maryland. All right, you can see the schedule for all our upcoming interviews at southbysouthwestedu.com slash studio. 
And you can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest EDU TV app available on Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, and Amazon Fire, and of course, iOS and Android mobile devices. See you later.